Yeah, my name is Ligia. I'm currently in Copenhagen, Denmark. It's very dark and rainy, but hopefully this will be an interesting discussion. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I have worked in a few different types and sizes of product organizations, applying agile ways of working from very different roles. I started by practicing very strict by the book practices of Scrum and safe uh, learning then how to adapt them and explain them to the more skeptical minds in the engineering world. Uh, and as part of my experience, I've created this distilled approach uh, with a strong belief that everyone can understand the foundational concepts that underpin agile methodologies. And as an engineering manager in the past, and now as a product manager with agile coaching background and approach to my work, I use these concepts to help teams that I work with find their, find their way and learn how to be agile and not just apply agile methodologies. So I usually talk about agility and not just agile. And it's a small distinction, but important one, that agility is a state of being agile, not just doing it, which means going beyond the well-known practices. Skeptical teams, um, it's something that I've been thinking about a lot lately. Um, many software industry professionals have had unsatisfactory experiences with how Agile methodologies have been applied in companies over the past 20 years. And this has led to teams wanting uh, nothing to do with Agile as a process anymore. That's what I call skeptical teams. And either they oppose it openly or they retreat into individual work they can do without being involved in the ways of working. I've been calling this Agile PTSD without actually knowing <laughs> that there is an agileptsd.org website. Uh, I really encourage you to go check it out. It's kind of fun to read. Um, and I think I could probably talk and even rant for hours um, about what's wrong with agile implementations in different companies and why things don't work well. But a few common problems are imposed strict agile processes where teams are not empowered to make any changes of their local context. There have been difficult organizational experiences with Agile where it has been created some sort of hierarchy around it. And most common complaint I hear is too many meetings and ceremonies. And it's usually because a lot of them either don't see the value in them or they're not being facilitated in a way that is valuable. Okay, so we established it doesn't work that well sometimes. So where do we go from here? When we have skeptical teams and we talk about what isn't working well, or they are very resistant to anything related to the agile domain, do we just throw it away? So if we feel like doing that, we should ask ourselves why. Is it just because we consider it a failed experiment or we are just tired of trying to apply these methodologies or because we really don't believe anymore in the core values behind them? Good food for thought. And after all my experiences with Agile, I can say I still believe in those principles. And I think practicing agility can contribute to amazing products, uh, great teams, and overall very enjoyable work life. Um, I like how Dave Farley, the pioneer of continuous delivery, puts it. Agile is a good approximation of where we should go. Please start with a manifesto and then we can talk. If you haven't had a chance, to read the Agile Manifesto, I invite you to try it. Um, and think also about how it was written when you go through it. I won't go into the details of the manifesto, it is linked here and you can just Google it, you'll find it immediately. But think a little bit about the story of how this was written. It was 2001 at the ski resort in Utah. 17 people met to talk, ski, relax, and try to find common ground. What emerged was the Agile Software Development Manifesto. There were in that, 17 people, representatives of extreme programming, Scrum, adaptive software development, Crystal, etc. A lot of these are not that used anymore, but they were extremely irrelevant at the time. And other sympathetic people that just needed to talk about an alternative to documentation-driven, heavyweight software development processes at the time. So with this image in mind, let's think about where we are today. Um, Alan Holop, a widely published Agile trainer, that speaks, he speaks about how Agile has become a priesthood. And Kent Beck, author of Extreme Programming, says 
we have been focusing on the wrong things around Agile instead of the core of it. And I'm very inspired by them and by all of those that have challenged the status quo in ways of working. So we have challenged it. They have challenged it 20 years ago when they created the Agile Manifesto. Why not continue challenging it today as well? So I've talked until now about what makes teams skeptical about Agile. And I want to validate their experiences and also provide some ideas on how to start healing from the Agile PTSD. And I think the way to do that is to go back to basics. So what is Agile? As we look back to that weekend when the manifesto came to life, we can imagine that feeling they had, the ideas that were spoken. And Agile is that, it's an idea, maybe a collection of ideas that were created by people that shared experiences, that shared a certain mentality that wanted to embrace change. And then they put it on paper and later online, uh, a set of principles that are at the foundation of how to be Agile. So, Agile does not mean faster. This is the first principle that I like to talk about. It means embracing change and creating space for flexibility, accepting that we cannot control all the variables. Agile doesn't mean that the development, design, problem-solving work itself will be done faster. Many companies struggle with this topic. There's a strong belief in some of them that by implementing Agile methodologies, we will help the company deliver the same features faster. That is wrong. The work to develop the feature is the same, but it does help very much with making sure that we are delivering the right solution faster. And we do that by making mistakes, by doing it in an iterative way and collaborating through the process with the customers. It means not locking the solution and leaving space to adjust and react to change. So this is where the distilled part of my presentation comes in. And when I look at stripping down um, everything from the main known agile frameworks, these three elements come in mind, these core practices come to mind, and I consider them to be the three pillars of being agile. They are time boxing, value delivery, and continuous improvement. Let's start with time boxing. Time box is a previously agreed period of time during which a team works steadily towards the completion of a goal. That's the definition. Rather than allowing to continue until the goal is reached and evaluating the time it has taken to get there, the time box approach consists of stopping the work when the time limit is reached and evaluating what was accomplished. When planning in the context of software development, we can either think of what we want to build, fixing the scope of it, and clearly define the quality at which to build it, and then we do it until it's done. That's the opposite of a time box. We cannot make sure how long development on something specific will take. This can be a very attractive way to work for engineers. You probably have had those experiences. Some engineers really love just taking the problem and working on it until it's done. It's a very natural thing, but it's too unpredictable for the business itself. In order to create predictability and a space to react to change um, that is not chaotic in its own, we can use a fixed period of time as our guide. So we fix the time, we uphold our quality standards and our work ethics, and we allow for the solution to be flexible. And one of the most common time boxes everybody has worked with is a sprint, but it's not the only one. Um, here are some more examples. So one example that might have come up, but maybe people haven't thought about it as a time box is time boxing a task. Um, it can be called a spike in some frameworks. It basically means we have a difficult, complex, unknown problem to solve. So instead of spending an infinite amount of time going down, trying to solve it, we time box it. We give it two, three days for someone to investigate, go deeper in it. And at the end, we check in and decide what we want to do next based on the information that we've accumulated in, in that time box. Um, an iteration, for example, in the context of Agile is a time box that usually takes one to four weeks. It can be called a sprint, but if you don't wanna call it a sprint or you don't wanna do Scrum or you have a team that is very against any terminology against Scrum, it's basically an iteration. It can be, it doesn't have to be a sprint. 
Um, another concept uh, is the increment. Uh, this comes, I think, from Scaled Agile. Um, the idea is you have a sprint of sprints or a time box that contains multiple other time boxes. Um, quarters can also be time boxes. Uh, if you use OKRs, you probably are used to that as well. So what do we do inside a time box? Well, we work towards a goal. We build something that can provide value and from which we can receive feedback that will then inform our next time box goals. Okay, but what if we cannot deliver the scooter in this image in one sprint? I have heard a lot of teams being so concerned with the fact that, okay, none of this makes sense because the way they develop, they cannot deliver something valuable in the hands of a customer on its own valuable in one sprint. That is majority of teams use two weeks. That means then that maybe the sprint or the duration of it is not the right time box for value delivery in your case. Or of course, that could be other reasons, but it depends on the complexity of your product. So we can, when we think about time boxing and delivering value in that time box, we can start backwards and look at what uh, is the time box at which you can pre predictably deliver value now in your product team, even if that means a quarter. It could be that big. It could be that it takes you that long to put together all the moving pieces. And once that is clear to you, then you can move that value delivery towards smaller and smaller time boxes. That is one way of improving this way of working. And then the second pillar that I talk about usually is value delivery. Basically, all the practices that we have should serve the delivery of value to the customer, the business itself, or internally to other teams and systems. Basically, how do we make sure that we are building the right things? There are so many different options and flavors, basically, when we organize ways of working around value delivery. Um, but one good place to start is answering the three magical questions of why, what, and how. Why usually informs your business value. What, your acceptance criteria, also great place where you can split pieces of work um, with the most value included in each of them. And the how is the solution the specs, that could be technical specifications, the design. Areas where you can apply this logic could be starting small, look at your tickets in Jira or other systems that you use, make sure they can all answer these stories, features, but also technical tasks, even bugs at some level could answer these three questions. Then you can go bigger, look at your team's way of working, ask, well, why do you need them? What is actually needed? in order to achieve a certain result, the outcome basically, and how they're implemented. And you can continue this way, asking these questions to try and find the value in the work we do and the way we do it. I really love this drawing. Uh, it is not made by me. It is made um, by someone from CRISP, SE. Um, but it basically shows um, a very, very interesting dilemma also in value delivery. So we have output, we work a lot. It's very natural to work with output. It's much harder to learn how to work with outcomes. Um, output does generate outcome and it does generate then impact. But if we focus too much on output, we get into a situation where customers basically do not want features. They want you to solve their problems. Then if you, spend too much time on the impact side, so on your bottom line line and, and revenue and KPIs, an organization can lose sight of its customers and start solving its own problems. So the sweet spot is to be customer centric and outcome driven. So how do we know when a product team is focusing on outcomes is when we're organizing the work around objectives related to customer outcomes when you work in product teams that engage with customers directly and you when you remove or at least try to avoid organizational silos that create handovers and when you understand your value streams uh, one great thing that you can try to do there is value stream mapping workshops um, that will put together all of your teams and you try to map everything from idea to product, de product delivery and product releases 
and see all the steps in between and understand where is your waste and how you can get the idea in the hands of the customer as fast as possible. Another thing to consider when thinking about value delivery um, is the simple Gherkin language. Um, if you haven't used it before, I challenge you to try it, at least on a couple of your features. Um, creating value-based features, basically writing it in a way that we see the value very well. So I'm really sorry we're not in a live audience where I can ask this question, but if you look at the sentence, where do you think the value is? The value is in the so that some reason. There is a reason why the customer needs or the user needs a certain action to be performed. And we need to focus um, our efforts into that area. Um, another important practice uh, is definition of ready and definition of done. Um, this can be applied to all types of tickets and also to product area, for example, to design work, to the product itself. Um, tickets that meet the definition of ready criteria uh, need to meet the definition of ready criteria before they can be moved to the implementation phase. And we use the definition of done to create a common understanding when something is done, meaning when the work is completed. And the definition of done needs to be created within the product or system in mind. So considering the context of your product and system. Usually uh, developers are very involved in that and product managers, designers are more involved in the definition of ready, but I really think this should be a whole team effort. Um, and the third pillar that I like to talk about uh, is continuous improvement. This is the most important one, actually. I left it for last, but experimentation is basically the most important agile concept. Um, we have to continuously check how things are going and try new things to make sure that we don't just follow the process, whatever process we have in place, just for the sake of following it, but because it actually brings us value. And the most common continuous improvement uh, meeting is the retrospective that usually happens if you use Scrum, um, or I have seen teams that don't use Scrum that have retrospectives, which is great, but I've mostly seen it done at just the development team level. And I would like to challenge everybody to think about continuous improvement at all levels of your organization that you can be a part of. Um, it could be in the design team, it could be at the product team level, it could be at managerial level, um, it could be at any level of organization. The important thing is to continuously think about what else can we try? How, how, this, how is this going? And basically when you do a session about a retrospective session. Some ideas here that I wanted to share is about listening, rinsing, and repeating is to first inspect the previous time box. That's usually what we do. We then analyze, we think about root causes and try to prioritize some areas of improvement that will bring us the most value and then implement gradual improvements. But there are some pitfalls to be aware of here. So looking um, through all my experience with running retrospectives for different teams, it can happen that we focus on things that the team cannot affect. Sometimes, well, sessions of ranting, uh, complaining basically about what is wrong in general can be good uh, and very refreshing. But if we do that every single time we do a retrospective, it's not a great idea because it makes us resentful and maybe ironical. Um, and condescending about the situation that we're in. So focusing on the context of your team and things you can affect, finding things that you can take action on can be very empowering. Um, sometimes it can happen that we never make time to try out any of the improvements we agree on. So we go through the retrospective session, we come up with some ideas of what we want to try, but then nobody finds the time to actually implement it. And sometimes there's no follow-up. So let's say we tried something new, let's say simple example, a new type of board in Jira. Um, and we just go along with it and we never come back to it to evaluate was, was that good? Did it solve the problem that we had? We forget sometimes to talk about that. And some of these experiments can be failures. We can try something and it won't work for us and it's totally fine to backtrack and get back to how things were before. And if you look at retrospecting items for, I don't know, the past six months in your team, and you see the same subjects 
and no change, then you are not continuously improving. These were the three main pillars. And I would like to summarize and end my talk with a simple takeaway. If you work in an organization where you can have the freedom and you're empowered to review, change, and experiment with your ways of working, please do that. If this, what I've shared today, can inspire you maybe to try to ask some questions, to try to see what time boxes you're using or how you're delivering value, try to look at it from a simple, productive ways of working perspective. It doesn't have to be Scrum. It doesn't have to be extreme programming. It doesn't have to be safe. It just needs to be simple and productive for you and your team. But then there may be some of you in here that work for enterprises that have very set in stone processes that you, from your place in the organization, cannot change at a systematic level. So if you can't affect the whole process, you might look at what I've talked about today and think, well, very nice, but I can't do any of that. It, I don't have the power to do any of that. What you can do then is try to automate as much of it as you can. So look at what you can affect and automating part of the process that is very reporting heavy, KPIs heavy, uh, that requires you to do things that don't feel productive for your team. Try to automate as much of it as you can. I really hope that could be a takeaway for some people here. Uh, and that is the, the end of my talk. Um, so are there any questions? Thank you very much. And Ligia, I, I like that it, it kind of reminded me a lot of what we do at, at UXDX and what we're trying to achieve, which is kind of making sure that people can improve their processes. Because I, I fully believe that the process often is the dictator of how, how good of an outcome you'll achieve. Um, so just to reiterate, if you have any questions, please post them on the um, chat box in uxdx.com or whichever platform you're watching this on. But I want to jump into, you kind of finished off with two things. You, you were saying sometimes teams don't follow up and implement on the ideas that they have in their retro. So is there anything, any tips you can give for making sure that people do or making sure they have the time? Because it's always, well, we have this deadline to hit. We have this deadline to hit. Mm -hmm. so is there any advice that you can offer people? Yeah, for sure. There are a few different things you can try. One of them would be to create some sort of community of practice, practice within your organization that cares for people from different roles that care about ways of working and create a roadmap for these improvements if they're bigger. If they're small and they can be done just within your own team, um, then allocating time, uh, usually a 20% allocation works for a lot of teams that I've worked with that can be used for learning for development um, of your own projects. And this can be something you can advocate to do there if the rest of your backlog is so full and you don't have any other time. So these are two, two ideas, but using a roadmap, it's a great way. Like we have a roadmap for our product, we can have a roadmap for our process. And how would you sell it? So I, I can just picture going up to some of my past companies and I'm like, I've got this roadmap and I want 20% of my time. <laughs> like, how do you sell that? Because that can often be quite a, like to the business they're going, no, that's gonna distract you. Go build what we're asking you to build. I think there are ways actually to measure uh, throughput and efficiency of how we're building things. Uh, if you can do that, please do it. Track the, the how productive you are basically in your team. And if you have identified certain practices or processes that you feel take too much of your time instead of development, that is a really good argument. I have managed once in one company to actually calculate man hours that were spent on dealing with a very inefficient process and kind of advocated from that point of view. It depends to whom you're selling it. Because if you're selling it to management that is very numbers focused, then try to find the numbers, try to make those work and try to present it from that perspective. Brilliant. And then the other angle is, for me, what I've noticed is what you can kind of manage within your team isn't the big stuff. It isn't mm -hmm. the kind of going to move the needle type of things. Whereas it's the stuff that's outside, that's the stuff that, as you said, keeps coming up and becomes a bit of a, a moaning session. But what can teams do? Because that is the big stuff. That is the stuff that can move the needle. So what can teams do to try 
and actually get some change happening there, which is outside of their direct control. Okay, so I'm a very big fan of asking for forgiveness instead of permission. So if there is some flexibility of things that you can do in your team, just go ahead and do them. If you know that they're not going to affect, of course, something very business critical. Um, and become that team that sets an example. If you can advocate for change inside your team and make your team work differently than everybody else in a way that has an impact, that you can measure that impact, you can get everybody in your team aligned on, let's us be that team that proves that we can do things differently and better. And then use that, communicate that across your organization, show those results, go and talk whatever town halls you have, wherever you can, get in there and talk about it. I have seen this work before. It, it is a tough one, um, but I think it's the only one where you can break that status quo. Uh, of course, if you have a good product manager involved uh, or an engineering manager that does, so we're talking about already levels of uh, people management uh, that you can get involved in this, the more the merrier. Uh, but if you don't, let's say, like you mentioned, you don't, you, you can't, uh, you can't convince them just do as much as you can to prove that you can do things differently. Yeah. Brilliant. No, it's, um, yeah, it, there's a lot of times it's like, whoops, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to do that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just go ahead. I do that with Jira all the time, wherever I go. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, well, I think that brings us to time. So thank you very much, Lydia. That was a, a fantastic presentation. I really enjoyed it. And I, I hope everybody did as well. Thank you so much.